Hi there. This is the Housing Voice podcast, and I am your host, Shane Phillips. Housing Voice is a production of the UCLA Lewis Center for Regional Policy Studies. My co-host today is Dr. Mike Manville, and this time we're talking with Dr. Dan Kuhlman of Iowa State University. The paper we're discussing this time is about what happens when you eliminate single-family zoning citywide, which is something you couldn't study before 2018 because no major U.S. city had done it yet. Minneapolis ended its apartment bans at the end of 2018, and now it allows up to three units on any residential parcel, so it finally gave us an opportunity to study what happens. Many of our listeners will know that this is very much a live debate in the housing policy and advocacy space. Some people will say, mostly disingenuously, I would argue, that ending single-family zoning will be the end of single-family homes, and that's pretty plainly untrue. But whether this kind of blanket upzoning improves affordability or not is an open question. Even if we have good reason to believe that it will, at least over the medium to long term. Dan's work gives us an early insight into how the price of single family properties changes when more development is allowed upon them and how the impacts might vary by the value of a home relative to its neighbors or by the affluence of a neighborhood relative to other neighborhoods. The results here are really interesting and they're super important, but as we discuss in the interview, there are many ways that the results can be interpreted, and so most of our time is spent exploring how we should interpret them, not just to understand what they can tell us, but what they probably can't tell us as well. I personally got a lot out of this conversation, and I think you will as well. As always, if you like the podcast, please be sure to subscribe or tell a friend about us. It really does help us reach more people. With us today is Professor Dan Kuhlman. Dan received his bachelor's degree from Carleton College and his master's and PhD from Cornell. And he's now an assistant professor of community and regional planning at Iowa State University. He's here to talk about his paper titled Upzoning and Single Family Housing Prices, a very early analysis of the Minneapolis 2040 plan in the Journal of American Planning Association. And uh, I did want to note that Mike Manville and Pavo and I think Mike Lenz as well are pretty extensively cited in this paper. And so I want to congratulate you on your foresight, knowing that we were going to start a podcast in 2021. <laughs> uh, it was a good way to get on. So good, yeah. good call. Uh, so thanks for coming on the show, Dan. Yeah, thanks for having me. And we have got Mike Manville back in the studio, aka each of our respective homes <laughs> as our co-host. <laughs> And Mike was actually Dan's PhD advisor at Cornell, so we're uh, happy to host this joyous reunion here. Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 good to see that uh, Dan overcame the initial hindrance of uh, bad advising. And thriving. <laughs> uh, so I, I claim no credit. Uh, <laughs> everything was just getting over the, the initial hurdle of me. I was going to say, it's always good. Uh, it's good practice to cite your advisor. I've been told so. It's. <laughs> <laughs> Only until you graduate. That's true. That's true. So before we get into your research, Dan, uh, we'll just start with something a little bit lighter, but still make it a little bit planning-esque. If you were giving us a tour of your city, and I think you're in Santa Fe right now, not yet in Ames, what would be the number one thing you'd want to show us? It can, it can be Santa Fe. It can be your hometown, wherever you like. Yeah, that's a, man, talking about my research is easy. This is a tough question. Um, <laughs> you know, I think, uh, yeah, I've, I've been lucky enough to be able to ride out you know, a good deal of the pandemic in Santa Fe where I have some friends and family. And I think, you know, I really love northern New Mexico and, and Santa Fe specifically. And so to show you one thing is to show you the city, I think. Um, mm -hmm. To answer this sort of as like a pedantic uh, urban planning professor, I think Santa Fe is a good example of it's a, it's a complicated city because it is beautiful and unique and, and the built environment's really interesting. Um, but it's also a city that was like super planned. Um, mm. You know, there's, there's tons of historic preservation regulations here. It's really, really hard to build. And especially, you know, in the last couple of years, the time that I've been here, it's just becoming increasingly unaffordable. It's, you know, it's, it's a place where you can afford to be as a tourist and a rich retiree and, and increasingly not much else. And so I think it's kind of an interesting, it's an interesting city to think about critically uh, in that way, because it is, it's unique, yet it's a place that is, uh, you know, it kind of pays for it, it pays for it with high housing prices. Yeah. And as a, as a fellow urban planner who can't help but tie anything back to housing policy, I respect that answer. Uh, <laughs> I think there's actually a good, maybe 99% invisible episode 
on this. So we'll make sure to include that in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. And what got you interested in housing and local public finance uh, as your academic focus? Yeah, that's a, uh, another good question. I mean, I think it's, I would like to think that I was unique in my intellectual development, but of course that's not the case. You know, I I graduated from my undergrad in 2008 in the, in the peak of one housing crisis um, and then was working and then went to grad school during the lead up to the current housing crisis. And so I think mm-hmm. I was just... You know, that that seemed to me to be the questions that we needed to, to think about these kind of housing questions generally. And then, you know, with the, the current housing crisis about how, you know, being in a planning program, how planning is affecting kind of housing affordability and what what we can do from a kind of a research perspective to help kind of undo some of those problems. And so mm-hmm. and then, in addition to having a great advisor who pushed me in the right direction as well. <laughs> of course. So today we are talking about what happens to home prices when you eliminate single family zoning. And as the first city in the entire country to eliminate R1 zoning citywide, Minneapolis is obviously a good place to start to ask that question. Like virtually every city in America, prior to 2018, the majority of Minneapolis residential land prohibited anything other than single unit detached homes on each parcel. Uh, multifamily housing, even you know something as modest as a duplex, couldn't be built. Now you can build at least three units on pretty much every residentially zoned parcel in the city. And at the time of this recording, actually, we are, I guess, done debating a similar proposal here in California. It's been passed by the Senate and the legis- and the Assembly um, and is just awaiting the governor's signature. And a few other cities have followed Minneapolis's lead on this as well and ended these apartment bans. Like any proposal that would increase the amount of housing in a community, these reforms always face you know, vehement opposition, and people make all kinds of arguments against them. Our listeners, I think, are familiar with a lot of those about parking and traffic and infrastructure, neighborhood character, more explicit classist and racist uh, claims about who belongs in a place or who is welcome. But the one you're exploring here in this paper is affordability. And... We have people who support zoning for greater density who argue that it will make housing more affordable. And at the same time, we have opponents who argue that it will make homes actually more expensive. So can you just walk us through that logic for the the latter claim? Um, How does upzoning make housing prices go up? Yeah, I mean, I'd push back on one thing you said there is like, I don't think I'm measuring affordability as we would generally conceive it in this paper. Mm -hmm. You know, when we think about affordability, we're talking about, you know, rents and and kind of a a lot of kind of complex things that I'm not, I'm not studying in this paper. And we'll talk about that. That's a good point in a second. But, you know, as, as I think I show in my paper, I I try and kind of unpack is that this, it it affects properties in kind of really complicated ways when you have these sort of blanket up zonings. Um, that I'm kind of studying here. So I think maybe a good way to conceptualize it is with like a, a simpler analogy where you think about, you know, like changing the zoning on a single property, like what that's going to do to the value of the property. So y'all are in, you know, LA, you could think of someone who purchased like a surface parking lot in downtown LA that was, you know, let's say there's zoning that's only allows surface parking lots on that, on that site. A developer could buy that. And, you know, obviously it has value as a surface parking lot. You can continue to operate it and kind of charge people to park there. But the way a developer could add a lot of value is to go and petition the city through like variance or kind of changing the zoning on that parcel and allow something denser. So allow, you know, an apartment building or a condo or an office or something like Mm -hmm. that. And by virtue of changing the zoning, you have, you would assume in downtown LA, increase the value of the property through the entitlement process, right? That's a lot of, by a lot, a lot. Yeah. And so the developers change, that's how developers add value to a lot of projects is by, you know, changing the entitlement and the kind of overnight, all of a sudden you can do a lot more with the property you have, um, kind of more property rights with it. And so I think that's, that's essentially what I'm measuring here in, in Minneapolis, except for it's not a single lot, it's every residential parcel in the city. So, you know, overnight when the comprehensive plan was adopted, you could continue to use the house as a single family, its current use as single family, but then all of a sudden you have the option to develop it a denser, a denser use. And so that's mm-hmm. sort of, I think, the way that I'm, I'm thinking about it. And so once you have this option, you know, it's not going to affect all properties. Some properties are their highest and best use of single family, but others, you know, maybe are going to be redeveloped over time. And, and again, that should be reflected in the, the, the price of the property, the price of the, you buy the property as a whole, but really it's reflected in the price of the land, I think. Right. And, you know, I appreciate your correction that this isn't really about affordability, but about prices and that distinction. And I think We'll get to that distinction and why it's so important. But, you know, the concern is you're going to upzone things 
and prices will go up and that equates to making things more affordable or more unaffordable. And, you know, a passage from your paper that really stood out to me was this line. You say, some may find it counterintuitive that a policy designed to address rising housing prices will, and as you argue, or as I argue, <laughs> must first increase the price of affected houses. So I think this is really a fundamental insight for this paper and, and the topic of upzoning generally. And it's one that's really rarely discussed when we're debating or planning zoning reforms. Can you tell us what you mean by that? Like, why does upzoning need to increase the price of affected parcels in order to actually address housing prices and maybe affordability more generally? Yeah, I mean, I think when we're talking about these these types of upzonings or even just approvals for individual projects, we sort of jump ahead. We jump ahead to like what's going to happen when the property is redeveloped and, you know, people are moving in there to rent the new, or rent or purchase the new unit. But there's like an interim step and particularly there's an interim step that's that's important with this type of kind of upzoning where you do have that, you know, first, if it's going to be rede redeveloped in the future, there needs to be value to that redevelopment and that value is going to affect the price. Again, price of land, the development option that, that, that redounds down to the land. Um, but again, then like we, we would expect in the future that, you know, if this is a popular plan and if there's actually demand for denser housing in Minneapolis, which I think most evidence suggests there is, over time, you're going to see redevelopment and then you're going to see the kind of more complicated affordability dynamics play out um, where you have, you know, people are going to move into those new units. They're going to free up their old units. Those units are going to be, you know, the filtering process is going to play out kind of over time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is this is a really important point. And I think the distinction Dan is drawing between the housing price and the land price is really important. And, and that when you have upzoning of single family homes, you know, the, the only thing on the land is this one house. And so if you want to buy the land, it's going to look like you're paying more for the house. But the only thing I would add on to what I think is Dan's very good explanation is that one way to think about this is that, you know, in many, if you want to, if, if you want to do that redevelopment, the first thing you have to do is knock that house over. Right. And so in some ways, the house uh, carries a negative value, right? Because if you want to access the full value of the land, you have to buy the house and then pay to demolish it. Mm -hmm. And so what you're really seeing is a rising land price that, that manifests as a house price because you can't buy the land without the house. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good point. So most of the parcels affected by this policy change, this ending of single family zoning, allowing up to three units per parcel, they already have a single family home on them. And what you found is that the sales price of those homes went up an estimated three to 5% faster in Minneapolis than for similar homes on just on the other side of the border from the city. I think we can be pretty confident then because of that research design that it was the upzoning that caused this you know, relatively faster increase in prices within Minneapolis, rather than it being something like falling interest rates, which we would expect to affect you know homes on both sides of the border pretty much the same regardless of where they're located before we talk about how and why the prices went up um, and what that means i do want to note that this is a kind of unusual situation where the price increase actually occurred before the formal upzoning even went into effect so can you tell our listeners how that came about yeah, I mean, so the process, I don't know if I would say it's unique, it's unique to Minneapolis. I think all of these processes are, are somewhat unique. But the way in which, uh, you know, this this change happened in Minneapolis is that the comprehensive plan was adopted, I think, in, in December of, was it 2018 originally by the by the city council. Um, but Minneapolis is part of a regional government systems, the, the Met Council. And so it had to go through their approval Kind of any comp plan within the Met Council needs to be approved by the Met Council. And so that took about a year for the Met Council to review the plan, update their plans, and then send it back to the, the city of Minneapolis for a final approval with some you know, minor changes. And then after mm -hmm. that, the city then had to go and actually update their zoning to reflect the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan is specific, I suppose, but really a large vision for the city, but was specific in the sense that it's going to remove kind of or allow by right three units on formerly R1, R1 properties. So what I'm doing here is I'm sort of taking it and, and kind of added to this unique is, is that, as you said at the beginning, that this was like one of the first, this was the first major city in the U.S. to, to do this type of kind of blanket up zoning and kind of remove single family mm -hmm. zoning. And it got a lot of press. It got a lot of press in a way that obviously the you know SB6 is going to get a lot of press too. 
SB9. But, you know, for, SB9, sorry. Yes. Um, SB9 is going to get a lot of press as well. But, you know, I think for a city that's medium sized like Minneapolis, New York Times wrote it up. There was the BBC, I mm-hmm. think, had an article about it. And so it was a kind of really high visibility change. And so what I'm doing is I'm measuring in that interim period, um, in part because that's when I had data for, but in part because I think it's an interesting kind of period in which, you know, everyone seems to be kind of aware that this change is coming, but you don't actually get to the point where the the change is implemented in the zoning code. And I think, you know, there's probably some complexity in in the way in which the city implemented in its zoning code that still makes it hard to build these properties. Or Mm -hmm. you can still do it by right, but you might have to go and get a, a variance because you know you can't fit that on your property with a setback and stuff like that. So this is kind of the the initial shock of this change. I'm trying to measure that uh, in terms of, of the prices that I'm measuring in this paper. So I think it'll be interesting to see if, if it, it persists after you know that the, the adoption was actually made in the zoning code. Right, and you point out that the initial proposal was really just you know what was approved in the 2040 plan before it went to the the was it Met Council? Yeah, they. It was basically just we're gonna end single family zoning and it's gonna we're gonna allow three plexes everywhere. You didn't have the setback rules, the parking rules, whatever else established yet. And so in a way, you're measuring like the most radical or aggressive approach um, where people just assume, well, I'm gonna be able to build a three plex anywhere. On the other hand, because it wasn't formally approved, maybe that's sort of putting some downward pressure where people are still a little unsure whether it's going to come about and they're maybe not willing to pay quite as much. So it's hard to know whether studying it during this period, if 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 you had studied it, if they had just approved it day one with the existing regulations um, and restrictions, maybe prices would have gone up even more. Maybe they would have actually gone up less. It's just, we can't know, I think. Yeah, one thing to note is that also in, in Minneapolis or in, in Minnesota, I think state law requires that if there's a conflict between zoning and the comprehensive plan, that the, compre- the comprehensive plan takes precedence. And so mm-hmm. there was some, I mean, I, I don't think it, it happened. I think there was a, a token number of, of, of approved triplexes during that period. But the city was sort of assuming that this change was going to come and approving properties kind of preemptively kind of knowing that it was going to come in the future because they didn't want to you know, open themselves up to a potential lawsuit. But I would, I would say, I, I think everything you guys said it makes sense to me, but I, I, my gut is that any amount of uncertainty is going to push the price down a little bit. Um, if you just think of, in general, when someone buys a house, forget about the potential land use. If the, the realtor is saying, you know, there might be asbestos in the basement. You know, it's like, <laughs> well, I'm going to pay a little less. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> So it's, you know, you can just imagine it, it would be that, that, that knowing exactly what it was that, that, that the buyer was getting into opportunities and limitations would um, nudge prices up a little bit more than, than just someone saying, hey, you know, they're going to let you build more on this lot. We're not sure exactly how yet, right? I mean, obviously there's going to be, you could imagine some subcomponent of the buying public that just interpreted that super optimistically and was like, I'll build a tower, you know, I'll pay more. Mm-hmm. But most people, I think, would probably be a little bit conservative. Yeah, a, a, a three-plex tower. Yeah. <laughs> each, each unit has four stories. Exactly. 12 stories tall. <laughs> exactly. So in this study, you don't assume that the zoning change will affect all neighborhoods or all properties or parcels equally. You hypothesize that the results might differ for homes in higher value neighborhoods versus lower value ones um, for individual properties with smaller or cheaper homes relative to those in you know the immediate vicinity. Can you explain for us a little bit about the reasoning behind those assumptions? There's sort of two things at play. You know, the first is that, you know, it's as I sort of said in my, my initial example, you would expect this, the, the kind of development option that this upzoning gives property owners is going to be most valuable when you're actually going to, you know, probably develop or redevelop, or there's a possibility to redevelop the property, right? So rezoning a parking lot in Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles is valuable because there's pretty proven high demand for housing or office in in that area, right? Mm -hmm. Alternatively, you could think about, you know, buying a parcel of land in rural Iowa and rezoning it for multifamily, right? Sure, it gives you more options with what you can do with your property, but no one's going to build, uh, you know, 
a dense multifamily in rural Iowa. And, you know, its use as agriculture is, in some of, is, is very valuable itself. It's already at its highest and best use. So, you know, mm-hmm. that zoning change in, in rural Iowa probably is just going to have no effect, essentially, on the price of the property because no one's going to do anything different with it. It's, it's not a binding change. Um, you know, the other thing that's, that's happening, and so, I, I, again, that this is what I'd sort of expect in Minneapolis, is that there's some properties that are, are better positioned to be redeveloped, potentially, right? They're, they're kind of underutilized in their current single-family use. They're near transit. Yeah, yeah. They're closer to downtown. You would expect those ones to see the benefit of this rezoning um, more, right? And then alternatively, like, you know, another way to sort of conceptualize this, and I remember when I was... We're all urban planners here, and we probably all took a land use law class at some point. And the way that, like, you know, real property rights are, you know, sometimes introduced to students is like a bundle of sticks where you have each stick being a component of what you can use the property for. So, you know, one stick is location, and then another stick is, you know, mineral rights or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we could think of the development option, kind of the regulatory approval, as being a stick within that bundle. And so up zone, you're adding a new stick. If that stick has value, it increases the price of the entire bundle, right? You know, alternatively, and this gets a little bit more complex, is that you could also think of, in certain situations, single-family zoning is almost like an insurance policy. It's an insurance policy. It binds you to the current use, but it's an insurance policy Mm -hmm. that people around you aren't going to change, aren't going to redevelop their property either, right? And so, you know, you can think especially in places like you see this in the suburbs all the time, right, is where you have really exclusionary zoning in in suburbs. One of the things, yeah, it means I can't develop my house denser, but then it makes me, gives me some kind of insurance about how other people are going to use their properties. I can't, but neither can my neighbors. Exactly. Yeah, it binds us to the same sort of contract, or at least this is the perceived effect, right? And so... That insurance is a stick within the bundle. And so up zoning, you're removing that stick. And so for some properties in, in neighborhoods that really value low congestion or value, you know, more cynically, you know, racially and economically homogenous areas, that stick remo- is removed. And if you're not going to redevelop the property, it's all of a sudden it's like, I just don't know what's going to happen to my neighbors. So it could actually, if the, I'm mixing my metaphors here now, but if the you know insurance stick outweighs the redevelopment option stick, you could actually see either no price change or or maybe a, a decrease in the value of the property as well. Mm-hmm. So that that's a great point, and I think it goes back to uh, the distinction that I raised earlier, which is that the the upzoning could push up the value of land, the land, and push down the value of the house. Right. This this piece of land now becomes. Uh, a little bit less desirable for someone who is, is, is very, places a high value on living in a detached single family home in a neighborhood of detached single family homes, right? Relative to a place where that upsetting hasn't happened, this is that, that person now faces a more uncertain future. They, they might buy a detached single family home and know that they will never ever sell it to a developer, but their neighbor might. And so, yeah, that if you have a lot of neighborhoods where people share that, that, that understanding, and then the houses become less valuable uh, in some ways because the land becomes more valuable. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Is it fair to say that, you know, different people, they value the land and the the house differently, like relative to one another? Like a person who wants to tear down a house and build a threeplex, their value is all land. And actually the house just represents negative value, as you said, Mike, versus someone who wants to live in it, you know, maybe the land has some value. That's not really clear to me, but they actually do value the house itself. And that's a, a significant share of it. Is that like a reasonable way to think about this? Uh, I'll take a shot at it. And then I'm curious to what, what Dan thinks. I mean, I, I think the, the the merit to what the distinction you just drew, Shane, is that um, certainly at the moment you're doing one, you're not doing the other, right? So if you're, if you're, if you're living in that detached single family house, you are not interested, at least right then, in becoming a developer and taking it down. Um, And if you're interested in becoming a developer and taking the house down, you can't simultaneously be the person who wants to live in that house. Like that's Mm -hmm. a very obvious distinction, but, um, (laughs) but I do think it's, and so one could then take that and and run the extension. It's like, well, there's just different types of people who do this, you know, but of course, one thing we often do in the social sciences is we, we divide people into, uh, you know, different time slices. Right. And so, uh, and this is where the entire concept of option value comes from that uh, you may be a person who wants to live in that house now, but actually appreciates, you know, you're not, uh, you really like the house and that's what you need. Maybe you've got a 
couple of kids and you like the school district nearby, but you also have a sense that things won't always be that way. And, and you like uh, the option of in 10 years or 15 years being able to sell it to a developer. Mm-hmm. And so I think there, there might well be, and of course we all can probably think of different types of people who would look at a, a single family property and imagine different best uses for them. But I also think that the same person over time um, might choose to use the house or sell the land depending on their circumstances. And I think that's a, a degree of flexibility that's a, a nice part of upzoning single family parcels. Yeah, no, I know. I totally agree. I think you could you can add to that, you know, potentially it's like when you purchase this thing, when you own your home, you are you're using your home, but you're also an investor. And so you're thinking about the long term value of your property. And so even if I am never going to redevelop my home, I can think about the, you know, the, the next person who might. Right. And so that's something that's valuable. You can, I mean, the you know, good example that's used a lot is like thinking about suburban schools, right? Like you as a homeowner in a suburban area, even if you don't have kids, have reason to care about the quality of your schools because it impacts the property of your home, right? And so it can lead to this, you know, NIMBY behavior in, in rural er- or, or in you know, suburban areas, even with people who don't have kids who care a lot about school quality because, hey, that, that, that affects my resale value at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And, and I do think, you know, just to, to add on to this, because I think it's important this discussion, and, and, and in many ways, Dan's paper, gets at what is sometimes um, seen as a puzzle in debates about upzoning, which is to say, on the one hand, homeowners object to it because they worry about what it does to their property values. And yet, most people agree that it would make their property more valuable. And, and I think the, the resolution to that lies in this distinction, which is that, yes, people worry about their property values, but a lot of them for a lot of them, that that value of their property is layered on top of a value on their neighborhood not changing and them being able to stay in place, mm-hmm. right? That that if you were someone who wants to stay in the house you have, right, and you want to stay in the house you have because you really like the neighborhood the way it is, then the increase in the value of your land may not mean very much to you, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, and I think I think if we don't sort of draw that distinction, then then a lot of the, then this whole sec part of the discussion about upzoning becomes hard to reconcile. It's like, oh, yeah, these homeowners are just being selfish. And you say, well, OK, but you just said they're turning away a big premium on their land. Yeah, I do think we and myself included tend to ascribe a little bit too much of this to financial motivations um, when a lot of it is just people like where they live and they might actually give something up or, you know, pass up. Uh, a, a rise in property value if it means they get to keep it the way it is today. I'll just add one more point to that just to finish it off, which is just I think there's a lot of evidence that people overlook opportunity costs, right? That um, mm. that one thing people understand is that if, if they block some development uh, in their single family neighborhood, you know, in part because they just really like their single family neighborhood, um, th- their, their home value probably will go up relative to what it was. Like, so they really are making a gain. And what they right. overlook is that the gain could be even larger, right? <laughs> yeah. If they just let this zoning happen, so there is, it's a, it's a it's a it, there's a distinction there where they're, um, it's not altruistic to block development or selfless. Like they are getting ahead, but they're getting ahead in the way that works best for them um, by by being able to continue to keep the neighborhood the way it was when they moved in, which of course they probably value because otherwise they wouldn't have paid a bunch of money to move into. It. I think there's a. This is something that's unique about these blanket upzonings in particular, where because you're upzoning everything and the you know number of potential development sites for those interested in redeveloping is so large that you probably don't expect the prices to go up very much for any specific parcel. So you have the situation where the price is not really going up, but everyone is losing that insurance function that nothing is going to change. And so you can see how people might, you know, especially dislike this. And I mean, we think it's good for affordability. And so I think I, I certainly would argue, and I think many of us would argue that is a worthwhile trade, but it's, it's, it's a different thing than upzoning like a specific neighborhood in a more concentrated way where the people whose homes are upzoned are probably going to go up in value by quite a bit. This is something where they're probably not. And as we see here, you know, maybe they go up a little bit, but not all that much. 
Yeah, I and mean, I think it's and it's important to remember too that like the again it's, it's different based on the characteristics of the neighborhood, and then what it, what I try and get into a little bit in my paper the characteristics of the property within the neighborhood too. Uh, right, so, right. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, so one of the things again, so we talked about kind of differences in neighborhoods. So you know, neighborhoods that you know are already kind of diverse land uses, and they have this one you know single family property that's only a single property family property by virtue of the pre, pre-existing zoning, right? Like it would have been mm-hmm. redeveloped years ago. You can think of those houses that are, you know, cheap rentals or, or something like that, um, or relatively poorly maintained rentals, let's say that. And so that you would expect difference between places. But then also, you know, the thing that I was trying to get out in this paper um, is looking at like, okay, you would think there's some properties, again, that are just um, kind of by virtue of the characteristics of the property and the lot are already at their kind of highest, best use in their current use. And there's some that are going to be... Um, you know, lower quality, older, would, would take either kind of substantial reinvestment to, to, to bring it up to the quality of the neighborhood or, you know, it, without the zoning, full on redevelopment. Um, there's my, my brother lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and, and, you know, a very nice neighborhood, lots of very expensive houses, but there's some holdout houses that are just that exist, you know, would have been redeveloped into, you know, four plexes for Harvard professors, if not for the single family zoning that makes it impossible to, to build anything on the you know literally houses with holes in the roof across the street and it really only exists because the the zoning protects it in its current use and so you can what i'm trying to get at in this paper is like looking at okay can we say something about kind of the relative position of individual properties in their neighborhood does that then affect how this blanket up zoning affects uh, the, the the kind of price increase and so in my brother's neighborhood the house across the street that has a hole in the roof if you were to up zone all of cambridge that house would, the not the house itself, obviously, but the land underneath it would become immensely more valuable because you can mm-hmm. develop it into a fourplex overnight or, or, or greater. I'll, I'll say one more thing and then I can ask you, you know, what you actually found with respect to these things. But just to, to illustrate this a little bit further, I think, you know, if you have that aging home that I don't know what the value might be in Minneapolis, maybe three or four hundred thousand dollars versus just, you know, across the street or whatever, someone just renovated their home before selling it or after, you know, it was flipped or something and it's going for $600,000. Either way, if you want to redevelop, you got to tear it down. So you're going to buy the $300,000 one if you can. Um, and you might even pay $330,000 uh, if that still makes sense for your for your project. So um, I think we're kind of hinting at what the results <laughs> were here. Uh, but can you tell us on both the kind of neighborhood income and on the you know, relative property value um, side of things, like what your results were? Yeah, you know, I, I found on the, the neighborhood measure, I mean, I think ultimately that is kind of in hindsight, probably the weakest measure I have or empirical finding I have in this paper. I think I, there's just better ways to measure it and, and hopefully someone else or in, in kind of future research, I'm better able to sort of think about which how, what, how to kind of divide neighborhoods in this study. Mm-hmm. The way you did it was just if if the neighborhood is above or below median household this, income, exactly, or, or median median value of the property. Um, okay, median value. So again, it. like I, I can get into more technically why I don't think that kind of in hindsight is the best way to do it. But I do find, you know, in that the the results are sort of inconsistent. But it does find that you know like the the lower valued neighborhoods seem to have the bigger impact. Um, the you know the, the 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 relative position that's more consistent and so i find pretty consistently that you know both by size and value the relative position of an individual property compared to neighbor its neighbors you know 250 i think i did 250 meter radius if i remember correctly 200 i think 200 yeah so that's that's an important that's an important finding statistically significant in all my results so like the the larger your house is relative to its neighbors the less uh, the value of the the upzoning um, mm. on that property. So okay, it gets a little difficult to interpret the coefficients in terms of you know because it's a, a triple interaction as opposed to a, just a single interaction and normal difference in differences. Um, but it, but it's significant and consistent and kind of directionally yeah. as you would expect it to be. Right. Something that you know I really like about this paper is how you can interpret it so many different ways, uh, for better or for worse, depending on your priorities and your perspective. You know, you find that the sale price of single family homes goes up as a result of the upzoning. So some people might argue that it's reducing affordability or even causing gentrification or something. On the other hand, three to 5% is not actually all that much. And as you argue in the paper, an increase in land value on some parcels may be necessary to spur housing production 
and hopefully improve affordability for Minneapolis or the region overall. And, you know, ultimately, if nothing happens to the sales prices, then the policy hasn't done anything. So it, it should increase prices somewhat. On a third hand, <laughs> the fact that the increase in sales prices uh, are concentrated among smaller and lower value homes might be an argument that the policy is taking the most affordable housing on the market and making it less affordable. On a fourth hand, for wealth equality purposes, which I think a lot of us are concerned with, um, you know, between racial groups and, and so forth, maybe the people who own the cheapest homes are exactly the people whose home values we want to go up the fastest. And you know, sales prices are going up. And just because sales prices are going up, that doesn't mean that rents are also going up. So if the policy succeeds at stabilizing rents on the one hand, while increasing property values for the least wealthy um, homeowners on the other, that sounds like it could be a win-win. So I could go on with these points and counterpoints, but to turn this into more of a question, how have you and you know people around you, people in Minneapolis maybe, been interpreting the findings from your paper? What kind of responses have you been getting about it? You know, generally favorable. I, I went to great pains, probably by as, as illustrated by your your kind of summary of my conclusion, to really kind of qualify my results. I think in part because it's it's somewhat it's it's not talked a lot about, and so I didn't want people to confuse what I'm finding here with increasing rents, which is absolutely not what I'm measuring. I can't measure it at this point. That's going to mm -hmm. be a longer question to see whether or not this changes the kind of affordability generally. So that's one one part of it. And so secondly, I mean, I think this is this is something I was thinking about, and 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 because I qualified it, I suppose I don't think anyone has really misinterpreted. Probably people still misinterpreted it, but um, I hopefully I think it's harder to misinterpret kind of exactly what I'm trying to say with this paper. Just at least at least on accident. Uh, yeah. I think <laughs> who knows? Who knows? I'm for sure, plenty of people will be happy yes. to misinterpret it intentionally. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, you know, I do think there's that. You know, I don't want to. I'm not certainly in this paper wading into that sort of normative question of like whether or not single family home ownership among low income families is a good thing or is, is something mm -hmm. specifically single family home ownership. Home ownership for low income people, you could argue, is, is, is beneficial. But for single family home ownership specifically, I, I maybe, maybe not. I don't know in Minneapolis specifically, but I think, you know, that this the benefit is more to those homeowners is probably good. Certainly the. You know, the Georgist in me is a little would be kind of upset if it's it's this is a windfall gain to the richest people who have made housing mm -hmm. really unaffordable in Minneapolis by the way that they stop all development kind of over right. time. Right. Another thing which maybe I'll pose to both of you as a question as I was sort of thinking through this as I was rereading my paper is, you know, again, the, the Georgist in me kind of has a bad taste in in my mouth when I think about the fact that, you know, this is a it is a windfall gain. It's a regulatory change that that affects homeowners and Homeowners in Minneapolis, by and large, are the ones who have profited from the fact that there's a supply constraint in Minneapolis, right? Um, we don't tend to, to focus on these changes and focus on the fact that can actually increase property values when we're talking about this from a policy perspective. And I don't know, like, should we talk about that more? Like, should we <laughs> use this more as, you know, as a carrot to try and get people to understand the benefits of potentially rezoning properties? I'll, I'll just give a quick answer here and say, I feel like I've made that argument and I, I have seen it. It doesn't seem to be persuasive <laughs> to many people, at least. I mean, but it's always hard to know because the people you interact with are usually people who already have their opinions formed on these things. And, you know, if you were to make that case to someone who's just kind of indifferent and doesn't really follow this stuff and is, you know, maybe uncertain about whether they support upzoning um, and you tell them, hey, you know, it could actually increase your property value. I could see that being persuasive. Mike? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're, it goes back to what we were talking about before. I think that if if you're heavily involved in a debate like this on the side of, you know, being against changing the zoning, you know, chances are you have a, a strong attachment to the status quo in your neighborhood. And, and if that's the case, then again, the sort of, you're just going to see this more as an erosion of your insurance and less as the benefit to your property values. But I do think, you know, there's a, there are, you know, one thing we know from research, you know, Catherine Einstein's research and other people's about who participates is that there is this vast, largely indifferent group of people, of people with weekly held opinions, and it might well sway them. And, you know, when, when people have done polling, scientific polling of Californians, most of them like the idea of upzoning property. Um, mm. And I don't know right. that that's necessarily because of property values, but like it's, 
you know, there's a difference between the person you're trying to persuade who has already said they are diametrically opposed to what you want and the person who doesn't really think much about land use law but happens to own a home. Uh, I, I do want to, you know, I, I think you met, Dan has made this great point twice, and I just want to really emphasize it a bit more, which is that he, he didn't study rents. And so, and, and rents really are what matter when we talk about affordability. And, and, and the rent really is, what would you pay to live in this unit today? And one, one way to think of the difference between a rent and a price is the price has all sorts of expectations built into it, which is exactly the reason why an upzoning raises the price, right? And you can just imagine the difference if as you went to one of these houses in Minneapolis post upzoning, um, how you would react if you were looking to rent the house or buy it, right? If someone mm -hmm. said to you, oh, if you buy this house, you know, uh, you have the option to turn it into uh, three units and you could sell it for a lot more money. You'd be like, oh, well, you know, th this is worth paying a little bit more for. Uh, if you were renting the house and someone <laughs> said, you know, at some point someone could knock this over and <laughs> build three smaller units on this parcel, uh, at best, you would be like, I don't care. I'll just sign me up for a one-year lease. Or you'd be like, whoa, I might even pay less. Like you might knock this yeah. over, right? So it's uh, it, it really is, and I think, you know, Dan's, Dan's research has not been, um, I think, to my knowledge, as aggressively and willfully misinterpreted as, for instance, Yona Freemarks, which found something similar. But it's, you know, this difference between a price, which has built into it all the sort of sale and, and wealth effects that could happen if you own the property and the rent, which is like, you know, if you own the property, what can you convince someone to live in it for this month? It really is a very important distinction. So to turn this to you know, what actually happened after that, I guess, or the more like policy side of things. My understanding now in 2021, I guess, you know, this initially was approved in December 2018. And then it, as you said, went to the Met Council for a year or so. So maybe late 2019 or so when it actually went into effect. It sounds like not a lot has really changed. Not a lot of properties, you know, have been uh, redevelopment applications have been submitted or building permits issued. Where is the city at on sort of the actual production side of things in response to this change in law? You know, the most recent kind of uh, number I saw was like 25 units in the last, like the year and a half that it's been implemented. So 25 units have been approved, per approved permits. I don't know how many have actually been constructed. I mean, I think challenging here is that it was coinciding with the pandemic. And so that right, has affected right. redevelopment. But I, I mean, honestly, you know, people will hold that up as, you know, evidence of the failure of this. And it's like, I don't think anyone was arguing that this is going to change. Well, people were certainly arguing disingenuously that this was going to change Minneapolis overnight, where they're going to be bulldozing full neighborhoods and, you know, building mm -hmm. you know, triplexes where there used to be single family homes. But I think, you know, on the, the, the proponents side of things, no one was saying this, this is going to be a piecemeal change and it's going to, you know, it's going to take time. And I think particularly the fact that you landed at triplexes, that's a, that's a difficult unit to develop, <laughs> unit style develop and, and maybe relatively expensive. And so it's going to take time for, you know, developers to develop the expertise and that kind of, of kind of home building for it actually to take place on any kind of measurable scale or, or kind of, you know, interesting scale at least. And so I think that's, you know, again, like I think 25 is, isn't, isn't nothing for sure. That's, you know, that's 75 <laughs> it's more close units. To nothing. <laughs> it's 75 more units than were there before. And so it's, it's, it's oh, so it's, along. it's yeah. 25 buildings, 25, 25 buildings. Units. Yeah. So got it. Got it. Um, Can you talk a little bit about, again, more on the policy side, why you think uptake has not been higher. I, I've heard, you know, there were setback requirements and these kinds of things that have really restricted what you can, what you can put on the land itself. Even if technically you can have three units, it's very hard to actually find the space for them basically. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not as well versed in that exactly. I mean, that's, I've heard those sort of anecdotes as well. That's like, you still have setbacks. You still have like, I think, you you kind of had like in certain situations you had to build on the original footprint I think was part of the the zoning requirement as well and so that that's mm. complicated and you know it, it it probably takes time to identify the correct properties and and go through the variance process when you need to when those those kind of regulations don't don't work but I think you know again I think it, time will tell to see whether or not this actually maybe maybe the zoning restrictions are still binding in a way that you know the buy right three units were not and then you know to that i would say then then i would expect that this price jump that i see is is going to be momentary and is going to you know moderate over time when people say 
hey, we're not actually developing these and, and there's not really demand or there's there's demand for them, but actually kind of producing them is, is proving complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and then and then further over time, it's possible that some of these problems get resolved. I think, you know, what you mentioned alluded to just a moment ago about figuring out how to do the triplex is that that's that could very well be a real issue. I mean, one of the aspects about, you know, the reason it's called missing middle housing. I mean, we haven't built it in so long that um, there aren't developers out there in Minneapolis or probably in the country who just have essentially off the shelf missing middle solutions, right? The way that in my neighborhood in Los Angeles, if you want to max out your single family zone, your single family uh, parcel, there's, I mean, there's things here we call the, we call them SketchUp houses. They've clearly been drafted on Google SketchUp and <laughs> you can just get the most out of it and they know exactly how to do it. And similarly, all across the country and you know, the, the relatively small share of land that we allow for multifamily, there is the standard five over one, right? That the developer knows how to do it and they can, there's always some idiosyncrasies, but there's something you can pull off the shelf and they can go in and build that. And we haven't built um, triplexes and fourplexes, you know, very much at all in much of the country for so long. And, you know, developers are like anyone else, which is like they do what's easy and what they're good at. And so it's going to take some time to, to solve these problems, including whatever sort of regulatory um, hurdles come from how this particular ruling uh, or zoning interacts with your setbacks, parking and so forth. So there, there's always a learning process. Yeah, I think I may have heard that there's also a, a floor area restriction of maybe only like a point five FAR, meaning a 5,000 square foot lot, you can only build a 2,500 square foot home or triplex. And that's, you know, that's not a lot. Um, there's not a lot of, of upside to that. But I do think to what Mike was alluding to earlier with ADUs, what we've seen here in California is we passed a law where we said, you know, you have to allow ADUs in your city or adopt some enabling legislation or whatever all across the state. And for the first year or two, not much happened. And just progressively, year after year, the legislature has come back and said, OK, what are what are the sticking points? Um, is it setbacks? Is it utility access fees? Is it other impact fees? Is it parking? Um, and they've just been pairing those things away. So I could see Minneapolis maybe doing something similar if they if they realize this just isn't delivering like they hoped it would. Yeah, hopefully <laughs> that, that would be an optimistic <laughs> way to view things. But. And, and I think it's, you know, again, something that, that all of us on this show and, and most of our listeners probably know is that there really is, there's no one thing, right, that, that, that a, it, through a combination of both intent and, you know, incidents, you know, incidental stuff, there's all sorts of things um, prevent the, the redevelopment of housing at an at a even modestly higher density. And so it, it's, it's symbolically big. I, I, I fully agree with that. A, a big city or a moderately sized city in the U.S. said no more single family zoning, just like it's symbolically very large that California has ended it. But I think most of us who, who watch this area know that, you know, this doesn't mean that tomorrow there's just going to be a gusher of new housing, right? It's a, it's a necessary step that we had to take, and it's probably going to reveal to us that we have to take a few more steps. Yeah. I mean, I think you could, viewing it more optimistically too, you could say, you know, SB9 was possible because you know, the, mm -hmm. I don't know how many people genuinely believed or genuinely believed that Minneapolis was going to be bulldozed. I mean, that was, I mean, yeah. there was a famously a sign in, in one of the neighborhoods that like, don't bulldoze our neighborhood um, in these, you know, million dollar Victorian homes. But, <laughs> you know, that, that it has been somewhat incremental, I think is benef could be beneficial for future changes in other places. So you can hold up Minneapolis to say, hey, you know, this is another option. It, you know, maybe it increased property values a little bit, and it didn't. You know, it's it's not overnight changing the characteristics in your neighborhood. If that was really a legitimate fear that you had, right? As the other thing that uh, that always comes up when with SB nine with this, you know, and, and which again, you know, alluding to my neighborhood, uh, one thing people don't fully understand, or perhaps choose not to understand, is that at any moment uh, their neighborhood could be bulldozed. Right. All that would happen, though, is that the existing single family house would be replaced by a really big single family house. <laughs> so that my, the two blocks south of me is an expensive single family neighborhood that is being slowly demolished. Bungalows and old style California uh, single family homes are being replaced by single family homes that could literally be apartment buildings. And so the, the bulldozing doesn't have much to do with the zoning. 
right? The bulldozing is is about how much that that property is worth and what someone thinks they can do with it. Uh, and I don't like to see bulldozing any more than the next person, but it's uh, the zoning is so somewhat incidental. To it. And if it's going to happen, probably yeah. better that it be for a more affordable condo yeah. or apartment building than a four million dollar five thousand square foot single family home. Exactly. <laughs> Um, I'll make sure to include in our show notes, a couple articles that I find, you know, useful and informative, both from the Sightline Institute, one of which I think gets to this point about how slowly things actually change in neighborhoods. I think it's the Sightline Institute. I'll have to confirm, but it basically just shows, you know, a neighborhood, I think in Portland that was actually up zoned decades ago, um, to allow for, you know, duplexes or maybe triplexes and how most parcels, they're exactly the same today decades later as they were when the zoning change happened. And the other article is more recent and it's looking at, um, since Portland did something similar to what Minneapolis did, but they actually provided more options for how, so not just three plexes, you can also do up to six units. If I think 50% of them are income restricted, you can do like a, a backyard mobile home type thing. You can do these more, uh, infill type things that don't require tearing down the existing unit. And that's something I think that is, is really important and, and maybe distinct from what's currently allowed in Minneapolis, where you can just build on the empty or under, you know, on the land where there's not currently a home on your property without having to tear down the existing one. And that is a lot easier. It's a lower barrier to entry to do that than to tear down the existing home and, and build from scratch. So um, what's uh, what's next for studying Minneapolis? Are you going to do the, this is the very early analysis. So you're going to do the just early or middle <laughs> yeah. analysis? Yeah, you know, I'd like to, I certainly like to go back and see, you know, if, if development happens and just kind of figuring out where it happens. I think kind of a related research, not in Minneapolis specifically, is just trying to, this this research kind of raised that question for me and kind of trying to understand where do we build this missing middle housing? Where have we done it historically? What were the conditions in place when we built it historically? Can that teach us something about the way in which, you know, planners and developers can use this type of housing kind of going forward in, in the way? Because again, like I think Mike said really well, we just don't, we haven't done it in so long that no one, you know, no one who's working today remembers when it was kind of a, a really kind of a, a common housing type. And so I think trying to understand where this type of housing was built, where it's still being built and, and seeing if that can kind of point to kind of future direction is, is a question that I'm kind of interested in. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, and just to, to caveat my earlier statement and just thinking of some people I know, of course, there are people out there who do duplexes, they do triplexes and so forth, but it's just nowhere near the, the industry standard, right? That the single family mm-hmm. home or the bigger multifamily is. And so that, that's what we need is a, is a getting to a, a point where like, yeah, if you're, if you're in the business, like you have a model for how to do um, but I think that history, if you pursue it, Dan, would be really interesting and really useful. Dan, is there anywhere uh, our listeners should find you? Twitter, website, anything? Uh, I have a website, dancoolman.com. I think it's, um, you can see <laughs> <laughs> me having wasted a couple hours to make a, a website. You can see my resume and stuff there. Um, I'm wandering around Santa Fe for the next three months. So Good. You see me here, say hi. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much. This was an amazing conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Show notes for this episode, key takeaways from the paper, and a transcript of the interview are on our website at lewis.ucla.edu. The UCLA Lewis Center is on Facebook and Twitter. I am on Twitter at Shane D. Phillips, and Mike is there at Michael Manville 6 Thanks for listening. Thanks again to Professor Kuhlman for joining us. And thanks to me for not making a joke about how he's a very cool man. See you next time.